Hi there, and welcome to this lecture on phase lock loops. Uh, we're gonna, the purpose of this lecture is really to provide an understanding of the basic architecture of PLLs, uh, what each of the functional blocks are, what their main purposes are, and then to arrive at a linearized model of the phase lock loop that we're going to use then to understand how to de design the phase lock loop, choose the key parameter values, things like the loop filter component values, uh, um, charge pump gain, and uh, BCO gain. Here's a very high level block diagram of phase lock loop. So what is a phase lock loop and what's it for? The purpose basically of a phase lock loop is to produce an output clock or sinusoidal signal of a precise frequency or sometimes to produce circuits that provide a precise delay. So basically what you can imagine is that a phase lock loop is kind of like a, a voltage reference on an integrated circuit, except instead of providing a constant voltage, it's providing some kind of a time reference or a time base. The problem is, although it's relatively easy to make oscillators on integrated circuits, it's very hard to ensure that they have a constant frequency. Uh, all the parameters that affect the frequency of any integrated oscillator we know how to make very significantly with process variations, temperature variations. So um, unlike, for example, a band gap reference, which is fully integrated, and that's possible because it relies on the band gap of silicon, which is something that's part of the integrated circuit. Um, for PLLs, we generally rely on an external reference coming into it, sort of an external time reference that's giving the PLL an idea for what a second is, right? Otherwise, there's no internal reference that provides that. So in this picture shown here, that uh, time reference is provided by a resonator that's outside the chip. Typically, it could be like a quartz crystal that's been precisely tuned and trimmed to have a very specific resonant frequency. Um, so that resonant frequency then is used to give a time reference to the PLL. And the job of the PLL is to basically tune the oscillator, which is integrated on the chip, tune it so that its output frequency is deterministically related to the resonant frequency of this off-chip crystal, or whatever the time reference is. And that will then make sure that even as process variations or temperature variations may arise, the oscillator's output is always at that fixed frequency. Um, most often we will see that the output frequency of the PLL is at uh, a higher, a significantly higher frequency than what the time reference is providing. So uh, in that case, you know, the output is going to be at some kind of multiple of the input frequency and in that application the PLL may be referred to as a frequency synthesizer or otherwise a, a frequency synthesis application. Basically it's creating this, synthesizing this frequency from some available fixed reference. So here's a block diagram of the phase lock loop and how it's going to accomplish that. It's a number of blocks here, but taken at a high level, let's just take a look. The input here, Vn, is the oscillating waveform, the reference clock, if you like. The output of the PLL is a, this Vos signal, which is another clock signal. Uh, in this case, it's at a higher frequency, so it's like a frequency synthesis application. It's at a higher frequency than the reference. Okay, And um, basically what the PLL is, is it's a negative feedback system with uh, a high gain. And we will see how to design the negative feedback system so that it's stable. So the net of it is that here, this first block at the input called the phase detector is going to observe the difference in phase between the reference and the PLL output, and then the negative feedback action will try and drive the output of that phase detector down to zero, okay? And uh, so assuming the loop is stable, it will do that, and then we will have the output of the PLL and the reference input at precisely the same phase or phase locked, so hence the name phase lock loop. So we have key components, uh, and we're going to take the key components of the PLL one at a time, talk a little bit about what each one of them does, what's its role in the loop, and for each one try and arrive at a linearized model for the behavior of it. Once we have a linearized model of each of the blocks in the PLL, we're then going to put all those linear models together and arrive at a linear model for the entire PLL.
which will allow us to then extract some design equations that will you know, allow us to go choose the parameters of the various components in the loop to achieve a certain kind of performance, whether it's dynamic behavior or st certain stability criteria or whatever. So starting here at the output, we start with what's labeled here VCO. VCO stands for Voltage Controlled Oscillator. It is basically the oscillator that's producing the output frequency. It's under voltage control because this voltage V control at its input is used to tune the frequency of the VCO. And so it's the job of the PLL, if you like, to produce the appropriate V control at all times so that the output is phase locked to the input. Now, I'm trying to get to a linear model for the PLL. Um, let's imagine that its output is this VOS signal, which is basically a sinusoid with, we assume, fixed amplitude E. In fact, the waveform doesn't have to be sinusoidal in shape. It could be a, more like a square wave clock or some other shape. But the main point is, you know, you can replace that sine function with any function that's periodic, with a period 2 pi. So we will see then, of course, this oscillator has a sort of nominal frequency omega naught, but it's also got this time varying phase that's captured by phi. Now a time varying phase can equivalently, equivalently be thought of as a time varying frequency, right? We can imagine that the instantaneous frequency of this oscillator is just like the time derivative of its phase signal. The phase signal is evolving, right? along a linear trajectory with a slope omega naught, and then there's variations around that that's captured by phi. So if we take the derivative of that phase term with respect to time, we get some, we get two parts. We get the affixed omega naught, and then we have this derivative of phi by dt. So the instantaneous frequency is the sum of those terms. Uh, if we imagine omega naught is, again, some kind of nominal frequency, uh, you know, around which the VCO is centered, and we just want to capture only deviations away from that omega naught. Okay, well then we define this new variable omega, which is the instantaneous frequency normalized with respect to omega naught. Or really basically like how far away from the instantaneous frequency, uh, sorry, from omega naught we are at any given particular point in time with the instantaneous frequency. So that then is just the derivative of the phase signal, d phi by dt. Now, the VCO circuits that are most common uh, end up converting the control voltage signal, V control, into an instantaneous frequency in an approximately proportional way. So if this instantaneous frequency deviation, omega, we assume that it's proportional to V control with a constant of proportionality chaos, then what it means is that, you know, since omega is equal to the derivative of the output phase, then the output phase of the oscillator is the integral of omega and therefore the integral of E control. We then arrive at this, that's how we then arrive at this linear model shown here at the bottom. Basically, the linear model captures the relationship between the input control voltage V control and the phase of the output uh, clock. And the two are related by this integral, 1 over S, and the gain constant, chaos. Chaos, you hear it referred to as the VCO gain. It has units of rads per second, so frequency per volt, right? Uh, and so that's the units of chaos. And then, of course, uh, phi as units of radians, V control, we're assuming as units of volts. So that's our, that's our linear model for the VCO. In practice, this may, there may not be a perfectly linear relationship between V-control and instantaneous frequency, but we can always presume it's linear if we restrict ourselves to small enough signals. Moving around the loop, the next component in the loop is the divider. The divider is needed in the common case where the output frequency is significantly higher than the input frequency. The divider then divides the frequency at the output down by some ratio n, produces a much lower frequency clock, which is now at the same nominal frequency as the reference input, allowing them to be easily compared by a phase detector circuit. So that's the job of the divider. And you see what that means if we assume that V div here, the output of the divider, is at the frequency of the output divided by n, and really it's V div that's being compared to Vn, or being locked to Vn, then what that tells us is that Vos must be n times higher than that, so that 
overall, assuming this PLL is working properly, the output of this PLL will be at a frequency exactly n times higher than the reference frequency. Therefore, this is sometimes referred to as an integer n PLL architecture. It m performs frequency synthesis, multiplies the reference frequency by factor n. It's basically determined by the divider ratio. How does a divider work? Well, there's different ways to make divider circuits, but you can think of its operation as just kind of being like a counter, and in fact, sometimes dividers are realized as counters, where we're just counting the number of, you know, for example, in this case, rising edges on the VOS signal. If we're counting, uh, if we're dividing by four, we may count four of them, and every four rising edges of VOS, in this case, we have one period of the output of the divider, right? Uh, so you can imagine, you know, there's not, it's not uh, particularly conceptually difficult to realize uh, other divide ratios as well. So what's a linear model for our divider? Well, if we want to obtain a linear, a linear model that models the relationship between the input uh, phase and the output phase, each expressed in radians, then what we see is that, well, really, I mean, assuming the divider is operating in this very ideal fashion as shown here, so that there's very little or no time delay through the divider, then basically what it means is that they have the same phase uh, in terms of seconds, but that if we want to express that phase in radians, then we're normalizing the output phase, uh, you know, so delta t is the same in, the, in both cases, but that we want to express delta t in terms of radians, well, we'll we're normalizing it to, with respect to a period that's n times longer here uh, at the output than it was at the input. So as a result, the phase in radians, right, uh, is uh, n times less at the output than it is at the input. So basically, the input phase, phi s, is divided by n in radians when expressed at the output. So here's a, the input-output model is just a divider, division by n, um, um, where we're, again, modeling the input and output phase. We're not modeling here the amplitude of the oscillations at the input or output. Again, we're kind of presuming in this straightforward linear model that the amplitude's roughly constant. And really what we're trying to capture is the, the phase of the output of the PLL relative to the reference input. So that's why we're focusing on these, this phase, the linear model of phase relationship. Another thing that this model is not capturing is latency through the divider. Again, it's assuming that the input and output are exactly sort of edges are exactly aligned in time. Um, for more accuracy, you could consider the, the time delay through the divider, some kind of latency through it. And in fact, because we're ignoring that, we're not going to capture some important practical phenomenon in a PLL. And I just want to point out at this time that when you properly model latency in the divider and elsewhere around the PLL, none of which we're going to be capturing in our model, what you'll see is that the PLL's bandwidth has to be limited to around one-tenth to one-twentieth of the input reference frequency just to ensure stability. This kind of makes sense because we will see that the, the PLL is basically looking at the edges of the reference clock and trying to align the output of the PLL or trying to align its edges with those of the reference. And clearly, we're not going to be able to track uh, those edges uh, any faster than they're arriving. I mean, we won't be able to track <laughs> uh, phase variations in the input until we get some more information about the phase of the input. That is, until we look at a couple of edges from it. So um, it kind of makes sense that the PLL, at its fastest, is going to have to be some kind of bandwidth that's related to how often the edges are coming in, the reference edges are coming in. So in practice, this works out, the, the, a practical ratio for stability is about one-tenth to one-twentieth of, uh, of the reference frequency for a, a loop bandwidth. This will maybe make a little more sense when we move on to talk about the complete linear model of PLL. So next up in the loop is the phase detector. The job of the phase detector is to sense the difference between the output uh, phase of the oscillator and the reference phase. So it's got to produce an output that's proportional to that phase difference. Uh, and of course, if the PLL is working properly, it's going to drive that average output, in this case, uh, usually a current. Um, can drive that average output current to zero. How does it work? Well, basically, um, the phase detector is 
comprises some logic that produces pulses whose width is proportional to the phase lag or lead of uh, between the input and output uh, clocks. So you get these pulses whose widths have to do with uh, how far apart the edges of those two signals are. And it's a relatively simple logic to do that. And then those digital pulse widths are turned into current pulses. And the wider the current pulses, then obviously the more charge that's being provided, on average, out of the phase detector. So the, at the end of the day, you get an output current, which we will see is, is, is comprises a bunch of pulses, uh, and the width of those pulses is proportional to the phase error, so that the average output current, if you like the duty cycle of that current waveform, is proportional to phase error, so its average value is proportional to phase error. Here's an example of some detector logic. I'm not going to go through the details of how the logic works, but just to show that it's not uh, particularly complicated, it comprises a couple of latches right, connected properly. And what's, you, know, you can understand the operation most easily by looking at the logic waveforms here. When V in leads the uh, output, the divided uh, clock, um, then we get a, these pulses coming out of the output PU, which stands for pull up. These pulses on the signal PU are going to try and, we'll see through the loop filter, they will raise the control voltage and therefore try and uh, speed up the divided clock, right, to try and, you know, sort of bring it into phase alignment with the reference. On the other hand, we we'll move over here, this part of the picture, we see that that VN is lagging the divided down reference. So in this case, we produce some pull down pulses whose width is proportional to that phase error. That's going to serve to drop the control voltage and again, slow down the output uh, clock to try to bring it in phase alignment. Since the width of those pulses, uh, you know, if you like these, these pulses have a duty cycle that's equal to the phase error over 2 pi, right, relative to 2 pi. So the, out, the average output current for any point in time is kind of like the phase error over 2 pi times the amplitude of the current pulses, which we label ICH, the charge pump current amplitude. So the gain of the phase detector, if you like, it takes the phase gain, uh, phase error, and multiplies it by ICH over 2 pi. And that's the average current that will come out of the phase of this charge pump type phase detector in response to a given phase error. So it's, the phase detector is modeled by nothing more than you know, a linear gain term, ICH over 2 pi. The input is uh, a phase error right, uh, in uh, radians, and the output's in, in amps. Right? So uh, the gain term, therefore, has a units of kind of amps per rads, as shown here. And finally, we've got the loop filter. The loop filter, in the case of a charge pump phase detector, accepts a current input and then has to produce the voltage output, V control, that's going into the VCO. The loop filter is the key uh, component we have to set things like the bandwidth, the tracking bandwidth with, that this negative feedback loop will operate in. And the com by so properly selecting the components in there, we can achieve a certain dynamic response, ensure a certain amount of stability and phase margin and so on. So these are our main... Those are our main design uh, parameters for controlling that are in the loop filter as well as the charge pump current ICH. Here's a typical loop filter in a charge pump PLL. It's certainly not the only one that can be used, but it's a good, uh, it's a, a very practical one that is used a lot and also just good for, um, for you know, basic understanding of, of most PLLs. Uh, once you understand this one, others or types of loop filters you can view as variants on this. Um, so now a quick rudimentary analysis would show you that the relationship between input current and output voltage for this loop filter has a second order response and that's, uh, that response is shown here, okay? So it's got a pole at DC, that's this term, that's just for the current being integrated on these capacitors and uh, then it's got another term here that uh, captures a zero because of this RC time constant and a secondary pole because of the interaction between R and the two capacitors. Now, typically, we will see that C2 is chosen to have a much smaller value than C1. So for the purpose of first-pass design and quick uh, understanding and modeling, we're going to ignore C2 
and assume it's not there. And then at the end of the design procedure, what we do is we go and we reintroduce C2, give it some non-zero value, a small value that provides some practical advantages we'll talk about later. But for now, let's just assume that C2 is not there. Focus on R and C1. In that case, we have a first order loop filter that uh, can be modeled with a finite zero at uh, one over R C1 and uh, a pole right at DC. Okay, that's because all the current ends up being integrated on C1. So stick with that first order approximation for the loop filter, a pole and a, uh, sorry, a pole at DC and a zero at one over RC. Now that brings us to our complete linear model of the PLL, right? So all the components, right? Here's the phase detector. It looks at the phase error, multiplies it by KPD, which we saw for a charge pump phase detector is ICH over 2 pi. There's a divider model down, uh, down here. The VCO model is shown here. And then here's our loop filter. And we're going to define the open loop response as L being just once around the loop. And there's the term shown there. This is a linear model. Lots of sort of uh, inaccuracies with this linear model, but as once the loop is in lock, uh, you know, the phase error will be hopefully zero or very, very close to zero. A lot of these signals will exhibit only very small changes around the, their lock steady state values so that a linearized model or small signal model, if you like, is, is very useful for explaining the dynamics once it's in lock. Not as useful for modeling the transient behavior when the PLL is first coming into lock, unfortunately, because there you you know there's, there may be some aspects of these small signal models that are not not accurate while you're going through these big initial transients. So for the charge pump type integer n uh, PLL that we've talked about mostly, recall that the loop filter has this kind of a kind of a response here. It's got a zero and a pole at DC. Uh, and we're going to define omega PLL as being kind of a natural frequency of the PLL. It turns out that it's a product of all these gain terms. Okay, I'm going to take the square root of that to get omega PLL. Uh, defined in this way, then we see that the loop gain of our PLL looks like this. We've got two poles at DC. One is coming from the loop filter, which has a pole at DC. And that's because the charge pump current is getting integrated on a capacitor. The other pole at DC, or the other integration, if you like, in the loop, is from the VCO. We saw that the VCO takes the control voltage and integrates it to produce an output phase. Right? So because of that, there's two poles at DC, two integrators in the loop, and therefore this type of PLL is typically called a type 2 PLL, referring to the two integrators in the loop. There's also this zero that's introduced by the loop filter. So why is the zero there? Why do we even need the resistor C. Well, without that zero, we would just have basically two integrators in a loop with some gain. And that system would not be stable, right? With two integrators in a loop, we've got a loop gain that is a minus 40 dB per decade slope, right? With infinite gain at DC, and a constant phase at minus 180. So clearly there'd be no phase margin there, right? When we get, we would get to some crossover frequency, which would in fact be omega PLL in the absence of the zero. And we'd have 180 degrees phase shift there. We'd have no, no phase margin. So that would not be stable. So the zero is actually introduced. That resistor is introduced in the loop filter to provide stability. So what the zero does is it, you know, puts a sort of kink, a, a 20 dB per decade kink in the open loop magnitude response. So it pushes out the unity gain bandwidth of the loop out, out further and also provides a phase lead. Okay, which is what gives us our phase margin. So that when we get to the gain crossover frequency omega t, the unity gain frequency of the loop, we're going to have some finite uh, phase margin here. Okay. So the zero has always got to be there for stability of a type 2 loop. The closed loop response of the PLL, right, that is the relationship between input phase and output phase, uh, looks like, like this. Some key points here you'll see that at DC, uh, we plug in S equals zero into this uh, relationship and we get just N, which makes sense because the output of the PLL is N times higher in frequency than the input. So its phase is, in terms of radians, is also, of course, N times higher. So that makes sense. That, that'll be a DC or for slow changes in the reference phase. 
for fast changes in the reference phase, very fast changes, obviously the PLL won't be able to react in time. It's not going to be able to adjust to be control in response to very fast changes in input phase. So it kind of serves as like a filter of phase variations in the input. It low pass filters phase variations in the input. And the low pass filter has this particular response that's, that's shown here uh, as H. It's a second order low pass response with a zero. So like all second order uh, responses, we can define its Q. And if it has a Q that's, that's uh, one or higher, certainly it will have some peaking, which may not be desirable. You know, typically is, is undesirable in a PLL. If we have a Q that's too high, what it means is that if I put in some phase variation in the reference around this frequency, meaning that the phase of the input clock is varying with that frequency, uh, those phase variations will actually be amplified at the output. So the output phase may be changing all over the place in response to much smaller phase changes in the input. That's typically not what you want. You want it to try and track the input phase, and if it can't track, then uh, at least do nothing. Don't actually over-track it or overcompensate. So peaking is usually un, uh, uh, undesired, so we usually go for a, a lower value of Q. Typical values might be Q equal to 0.5 or less. With Q equal to 0.5, there is still some small amount of peaking. Okay, as shown here, it's about a dB, and the peaking comes not, you know, with Q equal to a half. Clearly, it's not coming because of the uh, denominator here, uh, because with a Q of a half, there should be no peaking from a second order uh, low pass filter. But actually, it comes from the zero. The zero, remember, must, looking back to this picture, the zero must clearly be at a lower frequency than. Uh, omega T or omega PLL. And that's needed to so that the phase lead kicks in before we get to the unity gain frequency of the loop and then we have some phase margin. So because we've got a zero at a lower frequency than the poles of the PLL, then that zero will cause the magnitude response to start rising before the two poles kick in and then start pulling it back down again. So there will always be some peaking. Uh, in a PLL. It's just a consequence of requiring that zero for stability of the type 2 loop, and the zero's got to be at a lower frequency in the poles for stability. So it's inevitable, but with Q taken very, very small, you can get really minimal peaking. You can basically effectively make it go away. And that's what's shown here with Q equal to 0.1 on this plot. The problem with a very small value of Q is that it can be very hard to implement because the loop filter component values start getting a little ridiculous. And we'll see that when we work through an example later. Last point uh, is, is that there was this capacitor C2, which we kind of pretended it wasn't there. Why is C2 there? Well, without C2, you can remember that IPD, the phase detector output current, is actually this pulsy waveform. And so those pulses without C2 would all get dumped in through this resistor R. So would... Uh, cause a short spike in voltage at V control because we would get an IR drop from IPD, that pulse passing through R. We would have a short, you know, sort of uh, ohmic voltage drop there. So that big glitch on V control is usually undesired. It's going to basically yank the VCO back and forth with these glitches as they periodically appear from the phase detector. Not desirable. So to, to mitigate that, C2 is introduced and sort of like a deglitching capacitor. It helps smooth out the voltage on V control a little bit more. That's the interpretation in the time domain, which is, you know, an important practical reason why we put C2 there. In terms of the frequency domain model, really what it does is it introduces another pole, as we saw uh, previously. So now we've got the loop response L having still two poles at DC, and now this third pole uh, that's got to do with C2, C1, R. So it's still a type 2 PLL because there's two integrators in the loop, but now it's third. It's got a third order response. There's another pole, not a DC. So the key here is so as not to disturb the stability of the loop or a phase margin of it or anything like that is to locate this new pole frequency significantly beyond omega t so that, sure, it's going to cause the phase to, to lag a little bit. The phase will droop, but if that pole is at a much higher frequency than omega t, then we will still preserve our phase margin. This is, of course, just a cartoon sketch, a linear approximation of the phase response, but you get the, the idea here. So uh, typically, C2 may have to be 10 or even 100 or more times smaller than the value of C1. 
So here's, uh, you know, we're going to try and put all this together now into a, a, a design procedure. We've thrown a few principles out there as to how we want to select all the PLL loop filter parameters, but I think it's useful to walk through an example to see how all these things can be put into action. So the first point here uh, on the left, point A, is that the ratio between the desired PLL output frequency and the input reference frequency uh, is set by the divider ratio N. So, for example, if you have a 40 megahertz reference available and you want to uh, produce a 1.4 uh, gigahertz output, or let's, say, let's uh, consider first the example of a 1.6 gigahertz output, then you might say, well, I need to choose n equal 40, okay? And that would work. Now, in this particular example, example 19.8 taken from the text, the problem statement says that the PLL's job is to produce a programmable output frequency, an output frequency that can be set to any value in 20 megahertz steps between 1.4 and 1.6 gigahertz. So that means that we would like a PLL that depending on uh, some setting we choose, we can make it produce a 1.4 gig clock, a 1.42 gig clock, 1.44, 1.46, or anything all the way up to 1.58, 1.6 gigahertz. So because there's only 20 megahertz step, the, the approach that's generally taken is to take the 20 me 40 megahertz reference and divide it by 2 down to a 20 megahertz reference and use that as the input to an integer N PLL where n is now taken to be programmable over the range 70 to 80. So that means the PLL will then produce anywhere from 70 times 20 megahertz up to 80 times 20 megahertz. And if we make the division ratio n programmable, right, so that we can realize it can perform divide by 70, divide by 71, divide by 72, whatever we want up to divide by 80, now we've got our programmable frequency synthesizer that will give us any frequency we want in this range 1.4 to 1.6 gigs. So that's the uh, approach there. Uh, the VCO gain constant, K OS, is usually determined by circuit design considerations in the VCO. The only uh, key point is that it's got to be large enough to make sure that the VCO can actually provide all the output frequencies that are needed uh, from the PLL robustly in the presence of all the PVT variations we expect. So remember that, okay, uh, we may have a VCO that provides an output frequency of 1.5 gig today, but if the process changes, that 1.5 gig may become 1.6 gig. So we have to ensure that chaos, or the VCO tuning curve, gives us enough range that under any process corners, we can always turn it back via V control tune it back to give us our desired frequency, for example, 1.5 gig. Or in this particular case, uh, we have to be able to make sure that we can always cover any frequency from 1.4 to 1.6 gig, um, again, regardless of process voltage and temperature variations. So uh, in example 19.8, chaos is just specified. The idea is, okay, someone's already designed a VCO, and it has a, a gain, a VCO gain of 2 pi times 10 to the 8 rads per second volt. Okay. So that's just part of the problem statement in 19.8. Um, the next uh, premise in the design of the loop filter here is that uh, we, have, we choose the Q factor that we want from the loop. So um, when we want uh, minimal peaking uh, from the loop, then, uh, or nice, fast, uh, predictable settling behavior from the loop, uh, we choose a very, very small value for Q, get rid of the peaking. So typically something around 0 0.1 might be possible, 0 0.1 or perhaps a little higher. The problem is that that results in a large spread in component values that are needed. Specifically, C1 and C2 will have to be very, very different values in order to ensure that the pole introduced by C2, the, this third pole, doesn't interfere with the loop dynamics. So that can be difficult to realize then, this huge difference in capacitor values. Q equals 0 0.5 uh, is this compromise that does provide a little bit of peaking, but the capacitor values are usually much more reasonable, especially if you want all the capacitors integrated on chip. So usually what happens is when a very low value of Q is, is sought, one of the loop filter capacitors may have to be realized actually off chip, uh, and that is sometimes done. 
Uh, for a fully integrated PLL, a higher value of Q is often tolerated, just to make the capacitor values reasonable. So, uh, for this design, Q equals 0 0.5 is selected. And again, an example, 19.8. Um, the next premise here is that if you've got a, a high quality, low noise input reference clock available, then you want a high loop bandwidth, right? So that the PLL will track that nice, clean reference uh, as much as possible. So, um, the problem is that, again, the, the dynamics of the loop are such that the loop bandwidth is going to be limited to at most one tenth of the input reference frequency, and that's just needed to ensure stability of the loop. Although it's not really captured by our linear model, there's latency around that loop that provides this limitation. So, uh, in this case, the reference frequency is 20 megahertz because we had to take our 40 megahertz reference and divide it down to 20 uh, to give us our frequency resolution. So we've got 20 megahertz reference, one-tenth of that is 2 megahertz. So the loop bandwidth is set to be 2 megahertz in this example. Now with the loop bandwidth specified, there's some design equations that are useful for choosing omega PLL. So with Q equal a half, we have to take omega PLL to be 0.4 times the 3 dB loop bandwidth. Uh, or uh, if Q equals 0.1, we would have to take it to be 0.1 of the 3 dB bandwidth. So in this case, uh, we're using a Q value of 0.5. And these, these equations are derived uh, in the book. You can refer there for where these numbers are coming from, where these expressions are coming from. But in this case, we're using a Q of 0.5, so omega PLL has to be 0.4 times the 3 dB bandwidth, or 0.4 times 2 megahertz, which means omega PLL has to be 800 kilohertz. That's not the loop bandwidth. The loop bandwidth is still 2 megahertz. Omega PLL is just a des design parameter that will tell us what, for example, uh, the charge pump current needs to be. So now we've got N and chaos determined already, uh, and we have to now choose the, the gain of the phase detector, which is basically the charge pump current, and the gain of the loop filter, which has to do with the values of the capacitor and resistor value there, uh, to give us the value of omega PLL that we just calculated, in this case 800 kilohertz. So, um, so the, does the key design equation we're going to use is shown is shown here, right? For a charge pump loop filter, we have to take the ratio of uh, the charge pump current over C1 to uh, equal the, this expression here. And again, it's derived in the text. And we've all, we already know all these numbers. We know N, we know chaos. We know what omega PLL needs to be, uh, 800 kilohertz. So now we get a ratio for the charge pump current in C1. There's an extra degree of freedom here. We can use that to basically scale the value of the charge pump current and the capacitor value so that they're kind of in a reasonable range. You, for example, you may not want the charge pump current that's a, a picoamp because it's going to be very difficult to ensure that that value of one picoamp is reliable. On the other hand, uh, you don't want these numbers to be too large either because if the capacitor is, gets very, very big, it's very hard to put it on the integrated circuit. So, you know, we can scale the values up and down together to give us some, put them in some reasonable range, as long as their ratio meets this expression here. So now we've, uh, doing, doing that, we've now selected ICH and C1. The next point is just to select R in the loop filter, the resistor. The resistor determines the zero in the transfer function, and the zero must be Q times omega PLL. Um, and that's again derived in the book. So Q is 0.5, omega PLL is 800 kilohertz, which means the zero has to be 400 kilohertz. And then we know what C1 is, so we just choose R appropriately to give us that zero frequency. So in this particular case, it works out to 80, 80 kilohertz, assuming that C1 has been taken to be 5 picofarads. Now, those are kind of reasonable values. We've got a charge pump current of 100 microamps, capacitor of 5 picofarads, uh, resistor value of 80 kilohertz, like 80 kilo ohms. Those are all reasonable values for integration. Finally, the last task is to go and add the uh, deglitching capacitor C2. Um, with Q equal to 0.5, C2 can be just uh, one tenth or one eighth the value of C1, uh, and that will still put the third pole frequency much higher than the loop bandwidth, and therefore not interrupt the loop dynamics. So uh, C1 is 5 picofarads, one-tenth of that is uh, 
500 femtofarads. Again, a reasonable value for integration. So that just walks you through one uh, design procedure. Of course, any given design problem will have slightly different parts, slightly different constraints, and different aspects of the system may be, you know, uh, limiting your, your freedoms. But, you know, now we understand the basic uh, principles. A lot of the background uh, sort of mathematical derivations uh, are available in the book to understand where all these expressions are coming from. And uh, hopefully between the two, that will uh, provide you with uh, a quick uh, introduction to PLLs.